There, how are you? Well, hello. So how do you do this? Do you, uh, you take lunch home? Is that what you do? Because sometimes I take start packing. Lunch. Yeah, I have, depending on what they're having. Yes. Or how this is. If this goes really easy, yes. I have plenty of time to sit and eat and okay. the meal. Good. If I want to eat what they're serving. Right. Otherwise, either I've had a bad time, I don't have time, or right. I can't eat when it's not looking right. I right. just doesn't have to. They give, they'll always offer me to take the container. Yes. So now I'll go home. This is I do that every week week and try to great. Yeah, it's yeah. nice little, nice little oh, meal. Yeah. <laughs> oh. All right, good afternoon, fellow Rotarians, and welcome to the March 20th meeting of the Rotary Club of West Jacksonville. Zoom attendees, please mute yourself and submit any questions or comments via the chat function on Zoom, or unmute yourself and let us hear from you. Our invocation today will be given by Ike Sherlock, followed by Mary Pat Wilmire, who will lead us in the pledge. Thank you, President Dane. Uh, fellow Rotarians, visitors, please uh, bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, help us to remember as we walk along life's pathway that whatever we might say, let it only be the truth. Whatever we might think, say or do, let it be fair to all concerned. Whatever steps we take in life, let them build goodwill and better friendships. Whatever goals we strive to accomplish, let them be beneficial to all concerned. We ask you to help us to never lose sight of our many blessings. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the pledge to the greatest nation on earth. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, Ike. That was a very cool invitation. And uh, thank you to Ed Pratt Daniels, who helped greet today. Um, I'd like to begin with some Paul Harris fellow recognitions. I'd like to call up Mr. Corgan and his guests, as well as John Barley. For those of you who perhaps have not seen one of these before, this is one of the best ceremonies and one of the most 
prestigious recognitions that we are able to reward as a club. And certainly it is a pleasure to do it here today. Mr. Barlow, there's a forward right here. Yeah. This is a special time. And of course, we do a little bit of this by road just to remind you of why we're doing it. You know, the Paul Harris Fellowship, named the Paul Harris, as you know, who founded Brewery and Business Association of Chicago a long time ago. The fellowship was established in his honor in 1957 to express appreciation for the contribution of $1,000 in humanitarian and education programs of Rosen. One thing I would say parenthetically for those of you who don't receive it, the foundation does amazing things. And periodically they put out a short video of all of those programs. Part of it is going to kind of like today and what we're doing. The foundation programs include an array of projects to save and invigorate lives of people around the world and enhance international friendships and understanding. They provide educational opportunities, food, clean drinking water, health care, immunizations, and shelter for millions of people. These activities are funded, implemented, and managed by libertarians and military clubs around the world. For every thousand dollars contributed, 300 villages in India will have clean water. 700 farmers in Jamaica can raise enough fruit to feed their families. Ten deaf children in Uganda will receive the gift of hearing. Four orphans in Thailand will be supported from the Eight hundred people in the Philippines will be fed for a day by a local soup kitchen. All Harris fellows are designated to recognize individuals whose lives demonstrate a shared purpose with the objectives and mission of the Living Foundation. All right, I understand that you'd like to offer a few comments. Okay. I'm here today to present the Paul Harris to two of my relatives. Am I hearing you? You're good. Um, and First one is my granddaughter, Karen Yaldia. She's one of my seven granddaughters. She is a, a, a recent graduate from the University of, uh, no, I mean, excuse me, from Jackson University. And a bachelor's degree in musical science and theater, theory, and a position as a team now embarking on a, in this, an engagement as an excuse me. Engagement is not as I've been for My town, my daughter town. Wayne Rogers is one of my four sons. He came into the family when at JU he met his now wife, his daughter. <laughs> That was 28 years ago. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's been a teacher at, at Terry Park for 28 years. He has been the assistant principal. He has been the assistant athletic director. He has been a coach of every sport they have. He, he's still allowed in. <laughs> I'm very proud of both. And, and, um, and do this to them to 
Um, we're going to let my brother do something and that's all I've done. This is a small token of my appreciation of your investment. And for just one of the students, if we call it a pen and the certificate indicating how much my search is due by this award. Dwayne, he's already bragged on you at least once. Maybe you're going to do it again. Congratulations to the good certificate and friend. I'm sure if you find a small spot, you'd be more than happy to stick it on your tongue. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our latest call for this place. John. <laughs> I want to add one other point that is very low. This is my 11th law that I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. I'm trying to keep up with it because I think I'm up to 13 minutes. So. <laughs> Congratulations again. It's always such an honor to recognize great people with that recognition. Um, may I have Pierce Gibney and AJ Viles join me? Thank you, gentlemen. On behalf of the club, you have already signified a commitment of putting service above self. You've joined the avenues of service. You have participated in uh, a lot of our uh, meetings and extracurricular activities. And as such, you have met every qualification necessary to remove your red temporary badges. And it is my pleasure to bestow upon both of you your permanent. Thank you. By the time I learn it, I won't be president. <laughs> 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 John, do we have any pop-ups about the Alhambra fundraiser? Next week, our last meeting will be at the end of the month. It's a second hour. We'll be getting our events and the week after that. But don't miss next week. It's going to be better. Our Rio Bell will take more to Rio Bell. We have the table thing talk. We'll talk a little bit about the Jimmy Buffett, our connection to Jimmy Buffett. I want to make sure the folks that are going after the Alhambra event no more than the other guests that are there. So we have 150 tickets sold. We have 40 tickets left. Our best stuff, I think, we will show you the last two. So you shouldn't have to see it. Next week will be a lot of fun. Don't miss it. Bring your friends and family. The audience, Mary Pat will be giving away some prizes this week or uh, feeding you later. So next week, I want to dress up. I want to dress up. I forgot to wear it and wear it and wear but at the event, the month after our theme next week, that event at the Alhambra, we are going to encourage people to obviously dress up that particular night. Everybody that bought a ticket, all those that are sponsors, we appreciate 
sponsorship to recognize on the table. Um, they knew it was being margarita next week. Folks that didn't or not been able to participate in buy a hat. We're hoping that that event at the end, we'll have 50, 60 people wearing a margarita at the time. We'll get a picture and we'll get it promoted in the event. So come next week. It's a lot of fun. All right, thank you very much, John. We certainly appreciate all the hard work you put forward getting all of this together and uh, you and your entire committee very much in debt to you for that. So the, uh, directly following this meeting, the board will meet. It's a, it's a great way to uh, for a makeup if you've had an absence lately, anything like that. So keep that in mind five minutes after our meeting ends today. I'd like to bring up Carl Dawson to give us a, this week's family of rotary report. I'll save you. Oh. Thank you. That was great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Palmer. Actually, Carl was the stand in for last week because I was out at the play. And it reminds me that service takes lots of forms. There are any number of you here that do volunteer out at the players, so congratulations for your help on that uh, project. But then if you look on your table, there are a variety of ways to serve. You can serve by participating in the various events, like all the individuals and businesses that are on the sheets in front of you for the Margaritaville, or by participating in the Paul Harris uh, Foundation. Serve is the key issue. So for AJ and, and for Pierce, your task now is, yes, you're a member. Now help us get re-energized in serving others. Uh, there was an appeal in the newsletter last week to help you remember that when you have family of Rotary News, it's helpful for the members of the committee to get that directly. You can just email it directly to me. I can get it out to the committee, and it helps um, distribute that information around the entire club. Not everybody is able to be here physically in the room or even on Zoom every week. Um, so when you see that someone is missing at a table you typically frequent, I'd encourage you to get in contact with them, let them know that they were missed, and then find out what's going on in their lives so we can uh, participate with them in whatever that is. This week's birthday has really come down to Clint Dawkins, who is mostly, I think, up in North Carolina at this point. But uh, Clint will turn on the age on uh, March 25th. Um, and that's really it for this week. Are there any other tidbits from the floor? For your funny this week, because we typically do something that's a little bit funny. Um, you may have heard that there was uh, a robbery at the police station, but the only item that was stolen was a toilet. The cops have nothing to go on. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Thank you, Palmer. Uh, and apologies, Carl. <laughs> um, I'd like to bring up William Milne. We're going to do our weekly raffle. And uh, and for our sergeant at arms report. That's my name, mm -hmm. sir. All right. Good afternoon, Rotarians, and thank you all for all who are participating with this. We're happy to report that we're now up to twenty nine hundred and fifteen dollars for the fifty fifty. So I'm gonna I'm giving the cards a good a good shuffle here. I'm gonna ask President Bain on his return to draw your numbers and so get your numbers ready. Well, I purchased tickets. President elect Sam, would you draw? Well, no, we did too. Well, I didn't. Okay, there, right? I can't just one. Yeah, you know. Uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, okay. Did I get them out? Everybody ready? We're going to have 0, 6, 8, 5, 3, 1, 7, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it. He didn't do it. But. <laughs> I'm the one to shuffle the card, to be fair. I will ask somebody else has to draw the card. <laughs> Four seconds. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, for we don't have any visiting Rotarians today unless somebody's come in in the last 10 minutes. Anybody? Visiting Rotarians? Mr. Corgan? 
Okay. So now beginning with the guess, Ken Baker, you had two guests today. And I believe if Tom may say I'm a huge fan of the five and dime. So thank you for all the great work you do. Okay, so for the Corrigan family, will you please introduce your guest? <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, and John Runyon, we research your sugar. So, uh, But given the fundraiser that we're doing as a lifelong carrier head myself, I like to share two of my favorite Jimmy Buffett quotes. One of which is about our club, and especially just in life in general. If we couldn't laugh, we would all go insane. And then about the wonderful city of Jacksonville that we live in. It's a sweet, sweet light living by the salty sea. It includes my report. Thank you. Welcome to all of our guests today. It's a pleasure to have you guys with us. I'd like to bring up President-elect Tim Johnson to introduce today's uh, speaker. Thank you, President Dane. It's my pleasure to introduce today's luncheon speaker. Ladies and gentlemen and members of our Rotary Club, Jim Murphy he has a distinguished background as a Florida Supreme Court certified circuit court mediator. He specializes in bankruptcies, foreclosures, debt restructures, contract disputes, partnership disagreements, and construction defects. Jim has successfully mediated numerous complex cases, consistently prioritizing a business-centric approach that uncovers the optimal settlement path and alleviates emotional toll while avoiding lengthy court battles. Jim holds an MBA in finance from Georgetown University and a Bachelor of Science degree in economics from Clemson. He is going to bring to us today a wealth of experience. So please join me in welcoming Jim Murphy. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, James Murphy, and I'm a Florida Supreme Court Certified Circuit Court Mediator. In English, that means I help people who are involved in lawsuits to settle the differences without going to court. Uh, I also am a Rotarian at the uh, cell phone court. Okay. So, uh, you know, what is mediation? I call it peace for a reason. Mediation is a process that can help people who are in dispute work together to create an agreement that puts the issue behind. It happens with the help of a third party facilitator, someone who's neutral of both sides and has no personal stake in the outcome. That's immediate. Hey. Well, why is mediation important and why should you know about it? Well, because disagreements are part of life. Uh, we have disagreements in our family relationships, we have disagreements in our business relationships, and when we combine family with business, conflict is inevitable. 
it's wise for us to know that there are other ways to settle our differences that don't involve litigation. Well, mediation is built on a foundation that has four pillars. The first pillar is free will. Negotiating parties are completely free to decide for themselves whether or not they want to settle through mediation. No one can force them to do it. The second pillar is neutrality. That one's on me. I have to be completely unbiased and impartial toward the parties who are involved and the outcome that they choose for themselves. Pillar three is confidentiality. Mediation is a sealed environment. Nothing that's done done in mediation stays in mediation. Nothing leaks out. And the fourth pillar is autonomy. The negotiating parties are completely independent and free to decide for themselves their outcome. So we see that mediation is a process. It's a process because it gets results gradually by helping each side to realize what is both possible and practical. It opens the eyes and minds of people who initially can only imagine one outcome to better alternatives. Keep in mind that by, by the time a case comes to me, the two sides have taken extreme positions. Party A over here is demanding everything, while party B over here is unwilling to give up anything, right? Mediation uses reason and enlightenment to move people closer together in small steps. As a mediator, uh, the, our role is purely persuasive, or as a facilitator, my role is purely persuasive. Unlike a judge or an arbitrator, uh, mediators have no authority to make decisions or to render judgments. We're there strictly to encourage constructive dialogue in the search for a mutual agreement. I go into every session confident that there's a deal in here somewhere. The key is to keep the parties engaged in talking. Well, that's not so easy. As we said, the two sides have extreme positions. Both sides are reluctant to budge, and neither side wants to be the first to budge for fear of showing uh, weakness to their opposition. Well, we can't have progress without movement, and movement requires leverage. Well, I get that leverage by using show diplomacy, working with each side independently, and applying a series of steps. Step one is be prepared. Studies show that 80% of the work that goes into successful conflict resolution happens before the parties ever get together to negotiate. So that means we have to do our homework. For me, I have to read party A's complaint and I have to read party B's response to that complaint so I know what the lawsuit is all about. Then I also contact each party through their attorneys to get more information. Well, one of the things we have to figure out is what's the issue? There are two sides to every story, and it's amazing how differently each of the parties can uh, think about what the real uh, point of disagreement is. So the first thing we have to do is figure out what it is we disagree about. And once we know that, then we can prepare an action plan so that when we all get together, we can hit the ground running. So I, I go I continue the conversation and ask each side to identify and prioritize their own interests. Okay, what is it that's really important to you in this case? I ask each side to explore possibilities, including what should your initial proposal be, which will probably some, be something totally unreasonable. But also consider what the bottom line proposal is. What is it you can really live with in order to settle this case? I recommend that each side gather facts and documents to support the case, right? I'm not the one who's going to determine the outcome. The two sides are, right? So that means party A has to convince party B that they should settle on some terms to be determined. Likewise, party B has to convince party A that they should settle on some terms to be determined. Well, convincing someone to do something requires a compelling argument that requires evidence. So gather your evidence early so that we all get together, we can move forward. I also ask each side to anticipate the other party's needs. What are their interests? What demands are they likely to make? What are their positions? What are the strengths and weaknesses in their case? In step two, we engage. Generally, but not always, but generally, this means putting people, bringing people into one building or putting them into separate rooms for confidential negotiations where everyone can speak freely. Nothing that's told to me in these one-on-one -on -one sessions is shared with the other side unless I'm told explicitly to deliver a message. These one-on-one -on -one conversations help me to understand each side's reasons so we can find common ground and room for movement. The most important thing I can do at this phase is to listen. There are two sides of every story, and each party wants to be sure that the mediator is heard what they have to say and understands where they're coming from. What are the real concerns here? Why do the parties disagree? After all, they entered this relationship with common expectations, but something went wrong somewhere along the way. What was it? What matters most to each of the parties in terms of reaching a resolution? And it's important for all of us to consider 
If we don't reach an agreement, what happens then? All right, by now, everybody's starting to feel uh, a bit confident that there could be a path forward here. They're getting comfortable with the process. So now that everybody's starting to feel confident and comfortable, it's up to me to shake things up by becoming the devil's advocate. And the first thing we want to do is clarify the facts. A lot of things have been said. There's a lot of mud in the waters. We want to clear all that out and get down to what we just, everything just to what we know is true. This is where I challenge each side's position. I expose weaknesses in their arguments. And I plant seeds of doubt about the prospects for success in court. Well, all the while, I'm drawing an encouraging picture of what's possible. That picture becomes clearer and more vivid as the parties continue to negotiate. So finally, they begin to see common vision of what they can accomplish together. This is where the negotiations begin in earnest. And that's the beauty of mediation, right? Both sides collaborate to create a resolution that works for everyone. Okay, so now we're working together. We have a better idea of what each party's trying to achieve. I ask each side to propose alternative solutions. Okay, party A, how do you think we can put this behind us? Party B, how do you think this can work? There are no crazy ideas right now. Everything's on the table. Just put it on the list. Then I take the two lists and put them together. So now we have a long list. Some of the ideas are probably workable and some of them probably less. So we need to winnow that list down to something that we can manage. That'll help us to find direction. So the first thing we do is establish evaluation criteria. What is it we're trying to cure here? Which options offer a genuine remedy? What will they cost? Who's going to pay the bill? Is the solution feasible? Now, obviously, if the solution that's offered is, well, we're going to put this behind us for Jim Wright's check for a billion dollars, uh, that's not going to work. We have to think of something else. And it's important for all of us to consider how each option will benefit both sides. We're looking for a win-win here. All right, so now we're moving ahead. We've taken that long list and we've winnowed it down to just those alternatives that we think can work. We can prioritize each option and choose a path forward. Well, let's contrast mediation's collaborative approach with going to trial, where in court, a judge or a jury chooses a winner and a loser. Well, in that case, the issue is never really resolved, right? Because one side will always think that justice was not served. That's not to say that with a mediated agreement, Everyone goes home happy, but it's something we can live with. But clearly, both sides had to give up something for the agreement. Nobody gets everything they demanded at the beginning, but everybody gets something, and nobody goes home empty handed. So, why do people choose mediation? Well, sometimes it's forced on them. If you have a case that's scheduled for trial anywhere in the Fourth Circuit, which is where we are, uh, odds are that you're going to be ordered to try to settle your differences on your own by going to mediation. Now, you can be forced to go to mediation, but you can't be forced to settle in mediation. Settlement is voluntary. So if you decided you really just want to go to trial, then all you have to do is show up at uh, the session, sign the name on the attendance sheet, prove you were there, and then for all intents and purposes, you can go home. Well, why do that? You're already there. You're going to have to pay your half of the mediation fee anyway. You might as well give it a chance to work. You have nothing to lose. But most people mediate by choice. One reason is it can save time. The first thing that happens in any lawsuit is something called discovery. This is where lawyers on both sides demand copies of everything. Right? They want copies of financial statements, copies of bank statements, copies of your email correspondence, copies of your text messages, your paper correspondence, you name it, they want to have it. So uh, then there are the depositions where you have to go to somebody else's office to answer questions and get testimony on the road. All these activities take time away from something else you would rather be doing, like managing, managing your business uh, or being with your family. People choose to meet it because it can save money. Gathering all that information we just talked about has a cost, whether you hire somebody to collect it or if you collect it yourself. Then once all that information is collected, it has to be photocopied or scanned and sent to your attorney for review before it goes to opposing counsel. Well, your, your attorney's review of all those documents is all billable time, to say nothing about the hours that will have to be devoted to preparing for trial. People choose to mediate because it's less, less risky than going to trial, right? With a mediated, mediated agreement, you know what you have, and you have a part in creating it. If you go to court, a judge is 
or determine the outcome. You may go in thinking you have an unrecorded case only to be disappointed when the judgment comes down. And people choose to mediate because once the agreement is in place, everybody, get, everybody gets to return to a normal life. So what is it about mediation that makes it work so well? Well, for one thing, it removes obstacles to communication. Bringing people into one building but putting them to separate rooms takes personalities out of the mix, right? There's still plenty of discussion, but there's no shouting, there's no intimidation, there are no accusations, no interruptions, just constructive dialogue. Mediation works because it's a safe environment. Everything that's said and done in mediation is completely confidential. So the lawyers get to discuss openly all aspects of their position with their clients and with me. Both sides get to go through a reality test and a risk assessment. So these discussions open cracks in each party's case. Most doubts may make settlement the better option than gambling on an all or nothing judgment in court. <clears throat> Plus the attorneys get to focus on issues they don't want to discuss in front of opposing counsel but they still want their clients to consider, such as contributory factors. Let's take a personal injury case, for example, where my lawyer may say to me, hey, Jim, it's true that the grocery store was negligent for leaving that banana peel on the floor. But it's also true that if you had not been running down the aisle to grab that last package of Limburg cheese that was on the scale, you might have seen that banana peel and avoid slipping it. The judge will look unfavorably at your contribution to your own in injury. And mediation works because everything in mediation, that happens in mediation stays in mediation. The distinction here is that the positions that are taken in court cannot, um, taken in a session cannot be used in court. So if Tim Johnson sues me, for example, and we fail to reach an agreement in mediation, we'll go to trial. Okay. Uh, and then a Judge Springer then uh, finds in Tim's favor and awards him $100,000. I cannot then raise my hand and say, but your honor, wait a minute. Tim was willing to take $20,000 in mediation. That's all he should get today. That can't happen, okay? It's, it's inadmissible. And mediation works because reality sets in. It becomes clear throughout the course of the day that one side has a stronger case than the other. So the party with the weaker hand begins thinking, gee, if I go to court, I could lose everything. It will probably cost me less to cut a deal today. Likewise, the party with the stronger hand is thinking, yeah, I'll probably win this case, but there's no telling how a judge is going to respond to the evidence when it's presented by opposing counsel. I could get less than I expect, possibly even nothing at all. And maybe I may be wise to cut a deal that I can live with today. And mediation works because it's a relief. This, the dispute gets put into the past with an agreement everybody had a hand in creating. And it's a win-win for everybody, even the lawyers. In trial, one lawyer wins and one lawyer loses. But with a mediated agreement, both attorneys get to claim victory. So the moral of the story for mediation is give peace a chance. Mediation is valuable even if the two sides do not reach an agreement. As we said at the start, the two sides begin with extreme positions. If they haven't had a chance to talk things out through mediation, then nothing has happened to moderate those positions. So a trial becomes a knockdown, drag out fight to the finish where one side wins and one side loses. Mediation, though, helps preserve the relationship and uses reason to restore harmony and bring closure to everyone involved. I'll leave you with one final thought, and that is that it's never too early to bring a mediator into the game. If you find yourself in a disagreement that was rolling in the wrong direction, being a mediator in early can save everyone a lot of heartache, a lot of time, a lot of money. So with that, I will close and answer any questions you may have. Yes. And you probably get to hear. So when you have some other break based on some mediated dispute, right? You're working out the language that people use in the room, and then that's getting translated to the document. Is that correct? That's correct. Are you involved with it from the negotiation through the document, or do other people translate the agreement into a document? Well, that's a great question. I'm, my involvement generally is uh, the big picture. Okay, what is it we all agree on? This is what the issue was, and this is how we're going to put it behind us. Remember, in, in the room, along with the negotiating parties, there are two lawyers. 
And those lawyers get together and generally craft the, the verbiage that actually makes the agreement. So I'm there to create the agreement in principle, if you will, and the lawyers hammer out the, the verbiage. Yes. Okay, carrying that one step further, what happens after the document is created? Is that executed at like a contract where both sides sign it, or is that executed through the court? That's well, it's the agreement is executed, and then I, I let the court know that the agreement has been uh, that the agreement has been reached, and then it's a, and the agreement is binding. It's in writing. Everybody has signed it, and it's enforced. Thanks for being here, Jim. Thank you. Is there a time limit on a mediation process for number of days? Well, actually, the uh, actually no, there is not. However, the uh, and I've had some interesting cases. Most mediations uh, can be resolved or not within a day. Uh, so, but sometimes they go on longer. Uh, I had a very comp complex case it involved uh, an assisted living facility down in Bradenton. Uh, construction defects. And so all the subcontractors, subcontracts, et cetera, the insurance companies, the, the, the borrower, the bank, they were all involved in it. And so that went on for, for, for quite a while. Um, I also had a case where the, there's some cases actually don't resolve in the mediation session, but they do resolve afterward. So uh, I had one case once, it was a chapter 11 negotiation between the borrower and the bank, and the, uh, the borrower just wouldn't agree to anything, refused to agree to anything. So we ended the session at an impasse. Uh, I got a call several days later saying, hey, Jim, from the borrower saying, hey, Jim, I, I finally accepted the bank's terms. And, and so that was put into an agreement and uh, was, was binding. So uh, a lot of, it can end in a lot of different ways, successfully or, or not. <clears throat> yes. Uh, what, what percentage of your mediations uh, are successful? Uh, most of them, really. Uh, I mean, I'd say, I'm gonna say probably not ninety-five percent. Uh, it's it's just a matter of uh, coming to a meeting of the minds. People generally, uh, they, people may be seem intransigent at the start of the session, but by the end of the day, people begin to see reason, and they just want to put this behind them. I mean, by the time the cases come to me, there's been an awful lot of. Uh, tension and people just want to put it behind them. So they really are looking for a solution. You might have just answered my question, but I think we're all kind of a little worried that we've seen this great uptick in bad behavior and, and civil civility kind of deteriorating sure. a little bit. And uh, I was wondering if with the experience that you have, have you seen kind of an uptick in it in some of your negotiations? I wouldn't say it's an uptick. Uh, it's always a risk, though. Uh, you have a number of things. First of all, uh, in mediation, mediation is different from a trial in that there is somewhat less control, if you will. People feel more free to uh, exhibit their emotions. And so that's one of the reasons why I put people in separate rooms. There are times when that's not the case where people are very collaborative and cooperative and we can keep, get together and, and, and sort things out. But in many cases, that's not true. And so that's why we put people in, in separate rooms. I wouldn't say I've had an uptick, but most mediations start out emotionally charged and it, it takes uh, diplomacy and progress throughout the day in order to release some of that. My time is really my adversary. If an hour goes by without tangible progress, people tend to become discouraged and want to throw in the towel. But if they can see that we're inching along and making headway, then they become more uh, cooperative, collaborative, and some of that tension gets released. Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious, what is your background? How, I mean, how do you become a mediator? Do you need a background in psychology or law? Or... Yeah, I'll tell you, I, I, uh, it was an evolution. My thinking is that how I got into, I was a banker for 43 years. My background was finance. And in that course of that time, I got to see the full life cycle. Families and businesses go from happy, humble beginnings to prosperity and success, to strains in the relationship and too often to breakups. And since I was at the center of all things financial and trusted by both sides in, in the relationship, I was many times brought in to help my friends make peace. I was also trusted by people who were in business who found themselves in a conflict. I mean, maybe they were contractors. Maybe they knew how to put up drywall, put on a roof. Maybe they were doctors or dentists, right? But 
they weren't financial people. So they would come to me for help. So several years ago, as I was thinking about what comes next in my career, I said, well, you know, oh, and then in the Great Recession, uh, when I, I worked with dozens and dozens of people who were in deep financial distress, helping them to keep their doors open, help them keep their uh, property, uh, and then recover financially. So again, several years ago, as I was thinking, well, what comes next? I said, well, mediation is, uh, uh, maybe this is a problem. So that's how I got into it. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Jim. Uh, I was wondering if you had a, a, a case that stuck out in your head that influenced your career, positive or negative, and why. If you could tell us about a, a little bit about it. In terms of mediation? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. I, uh, I think the one that keeps coming back to my memory, I've, I've been involved in a lot of disputes and trying to help people settle them. But one that keeps coming up is one, it was a business dispute. These were two partners who built a successful business here in Jacksonville, doing great. And then one of the partners decided he was going to have an affair. And the other partner just didn't care for the morality. I thought it was going to be bad for the business, but if there was a strain in the relationship, and so the business was in danger of breaking up. And so it was a matter of helping those two parties understand where each of them was coming from. There were contributing factors on, on, on each side, and it was just helping each side to realize, see, see the situation from the other person's perspective so that they could determine a path forward. In the end, the two partners decided to end their partnership, uh, but they did it in a way that was constructive, where one partner kept the business, the other person got paid for giving up their portion of the business. So that's that's one case that just keeps coming up in my mind. So maybe that's the one that influenced me the most. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Can't do anything without these, right? Um, yeah, no, that's fascinating, Jim. As, as you probably uh, know, we have a pile of attorneys here, and you made a statement very uh, early on that they're known to take extreme positions. I, I, I just wanted to say on behalf of all of us, Nobody in here would ever do that. <laughs> All right, so a couple of reminders before we get out of here today. Please join us next week. It's going to be in a, a very exciting program uh, for all of the reasons uh, that John mentioned earlier. Wear your Hawaiian shirts. Let's celebrate uh, the upcoming fundraiser at the Alhambra and uh, really put our best foot forward to benefit youth services here on the West Side. That being said, I'd like to invite Pierce Giddy to lead us in the four-way test. Afternoon, everybody. Please join me in reciting the four-way tests for the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, we'll build goodwill and better friendships. will be beneficial to all concerned. Thank you, Pierce. Now, before we go today, it's come to my attention uh, that Scott Emery, the past president, um, is currently unable to leave his home, and the family is welcoming anybody that would like to swing by and see him. Um, would you like to add anything to that, Gigi? Um, please, 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 to be able to visit with Scott. Scott's very talkative, very, very animated. I spoke with his daughter, Stephanie. She's the, um, has actually been cracking up. And there's some levity to everything that's going on right now. But the family would really enjoy it because now they are um, housewives. So they really would enjoy a visit to my At any time, just give them a ring and show up. Well, certainly prayers and positive energy uh, for the entire family. And if you can make it out there to see them, please do that. 
Um, that being said, board meeting in five minutes. Let's go make the world a better place.